pretend like I'm speaking to a room full of strangers. Well, you will be later. That's true. Good morning, all. I'm Ken Guillory, a retired Army officer, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Conference for Disarmament in Europe, which is one of the first actual arms control measures that the United States participated in where countries actually went somewhere and inspected one another. We talked about it before, but we never actually had U.S. soldiers or U.S. inspectors on the soil of countries in the Warsaw Pact, or vice versa, because they came and inspected us also. This is the first time this actually happened, or the first agreement. And I was one of the members of the team on the third inspection that the United States conducted, which was pretty close to um, one of the early inspections of all of these things. Now later, I became the chief of the on-site inspection agency in Europe, which conducted all the inspections uh, throughout 1994 to 1998. This was in 1988. Uh, and so I had a little bit of experience by this time, by the time I got to the on-site inspection agency. This was interesting. This was a, a first-time thing. And one of the interesting things about it was that nobody had any experience of doing this before. And so everything was sort of experimental. So I'll try to explain that as we go along. All right. From the Helsinki Accords uh, under President Carter in 1975, there were, came what were called three baskets, three different areas of agreement among the European countries. It wasn't just the United States and the Soviet Union, although clearly those were the two leaders, but other countries participated also. So there were the human rights provisions, which I'm not going to go into detail on, but which turned out to be pretty important. Let's be frank, this is mostly aimed at dissidents and Jews in the Soviet Union, although there were other people involved. Right? Then the economic cooperation basket, which the East Europeans were keen on. They needed help. So the economic baskets were important and assisted in getting an agreement and were then used to negotiate to get some of the other things that we wanted number one and number three. Number three is the military portion of these things, what were called confidence building measures. Today they're called CSBMs, confidence and security building measures, right? uh, to reduce military tension. Uh, because there wasn't, there were no agreements on, in place at the time to do this. It was simply a, a balance of power between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. Conference met every four years, 75 in Helsinki. Uh, and I know we go back to in the United States history, and a lot of people remember the presidency of Jimmy Carter and thought it was terrible. I, I understand that. But under Carter, we had the Helsinki Agreement, which turned out to be pretty important. So, in that sense, my hat's off to him. All right? um, so, again, in these other years, 1979, 1983, and 87 in Stockholm, is the one that we used for this set of inspections. It was called the Stockholm document. Today, it's been updated and it's called the Vienna document because all this happens in Vienna. Right? Uh, and even in my later uh, job in, uh, at the on-site inspection agency in Frankfurt, um, I went to and from Vienna a number of times for what we call Vienna document meetings, just the update from the Stockholm document. Okay. So, Stockholm Treaty, just a quick uh, description, I guess. We, this is the military part of it. I'm not going into the other, the economic and the human rights provisions. We agreed to notify each other of military activity. And I love the way we use the language in some of these agreements because we can't say military exercises. We can't say, we, we, so we say activity. That covers a lot of bases. Right. And the crux of it was we didn't want anybody attacking one another under the guise of an exercise. So we put some limits on what you could do in exercises. And if you exceeded those limits, you had to tell everybody. So that, that's what this was. You had to notify if there was any ground force exercise in, uh, in excess of 13,000 troops, 300 battle tanks, 300 naval infantry, marines, amphibious units, uh, or 200 aircraft sorties. 
So you have to, you have to tell everybody, hey, I am having this big exercise. Right. And then they could decide what to do from there. You had to provide an annual calendar. This is a big thing, and this is true in all the arms control treaties, and even later in the uh, Conventional Forces Europe Treaty, you had to provide a calendar, and you had to provide a declaration of what you have so that they can go, we can go check it. We did the same thing. Countries didn't like doing that. You have to tell everybody what your military equipment is and, in essence, what your capabilities are. They didn't really appreciate that. But you had to do it, and when, when you would go inspect, we would then look at the declaration and say, okay, here's what they say. Let's go see if that's what's there. You couldn't always tell 100%, but you could, you could tell pretty well. Okay? And then if you had a larger exercise, and that's part of what happens in this particular scenario, of 17,000 or more, you had to invite observers. This happened on this exercise. I'll explain to you in a minute. It's a pretty interesting thing. Okay? Now, this is a, a long laundry list of things. Uh, my intent <coughs> isn't to read the whole thing to you, but there are a couple of things that you have to do. Each country had a, could inspect three per year, and they had to ex accept up to three. Now, you could accept more than three, but if somebody called you for inspection number four, you could say, no, we've reached our limit, can't come. And, and that's it, that's the end of the, the discussion. <coughs> if it's before then, you had to accept it. Uh, Another important part, the inspection counts against the country on whose territory it takes place, not whose forces you inspect. We went to East Germany, so the, territory, the inspection counted against East Germany, although we inspected Russian forces because they were stationed there. And the, the same thing happened for us. If the, if the Russians came or the Poles or the Romanians came to Belgium, they could inspect U.S. forces because there were some in Belgium or wherever else. Okay. Uh, inspection team was four members, 48 hours. Uh, you had to declare a specified area. So in essence, you had to have map coordinates that said, you know, that it was an outline. It said, here's where I need to be. It could be any shape, but once you declare that area, that's the only place you could go. You couldn't go outside that area. Uh, even if you saw something else, you couldn't go outside that area because that's what the treaty said. So you had to do it. Okay. Uh, and then the host country had to provide transportation, hospitality. They had to feed you and transport you here and there. Okay. All right. Here's how the U.S. implemented this. This was ours. The United States European Command had a 12-man team under Don Stovall. Had this thing get put together. Stovall is a former chief of the U.S. military liaison mission in Potsdam. Are you familiar with that? You know what that is? It was the team, the liaison team left after World War II. In, in this case in Berlin, or right outside of Berlin in Potsdam. And the, it was there to maneuver around Russian forces, Russian air, Russian occupied areas, looking for IOH, indications of hostility. The Russians also had a similar team in West Germany. And they did the same thing. They were looking for indications of hostility. Okay. Uh, so what did we do? We took guys who were experienced in dealing with the Soviets and put them in charge of this team. And what did Stovall do? He looked for experienced Soviet FAOs, foreign area officers. I was one of those. So were other members of the team. All right. We did training at Grafenbeer with uh, US and German forces. In other words, we learned how to inspect. We figured out what our procedures were going to be. Um, and then up at Vine, down, I said, up, down in Weingarten in southern West Germany, where the German forces had uh, a vehicle recognition uh, setup, a uh, reconnaissance setup for their reconnaissance forces. But vehicle recognition is critical because you may not get to see something except at a distance or whatever, and you need to know what it is. So we did the vehicle recognition course down at Vanguard. It's pretty interesting stuff, actually. All right. NATO did coordinate this stuff in the 80s. This was a first time thing. We weren't good at this. We're much better at it now. Uh, but the lessons we learned from there paid off in the CFE, this is the one I was involved in later, Conventional Forces Europe Treaty, how we coordinated things so that we didn't trip all over each other. Now that might not sound like a big deal, but if you've got two, two inspections going on in the same part of the Soviet Union at the same time, why are you doing this? You say, you're, you're wasting one, and we didn't want to waste anything. 
So NATO learned how to coordinate this stuff pretty well, as a matter of fact. All right. This is just who we were, Don Stovall, Warren Wagner, and Ralph Brunner, both friends of mine, both Soviet FAOs, just like me. They were working at UCOM with Stovall at the time. I was working in the 56th Field Artillery Command, the Pershing Command, if you remember all, all the Pershing thing, but it was right down the street in Swedish Command, so it's about 55, 60 kilometers away. It wasn't that far. Um, and I got called, I forgot when it was, on a Friday morning or something, said, pack your stuff, come to, come to Stuttgart. That's the kind of notice I got. So I did. Okay. Uh, why well, was I on that team? Actually, I was going to go on the previous inspection into Hungary because uh, that was one of the others that we did. And I got pulled at the last minute for another friend of ours named Nick Salas, but Nick is a native Hungarian speaker. It doesn't make sense to take me, though does not speak Hungarian, for a native Hungarian speaker. And Stovall called me and said, hey, Ken, I don't think you can, I may get you in one of these inspections because I, we're out of inspections or we're not going to do any more, there are no more planned. Well, the one I went to wasn't planned, but I was the guy who spoke German and Russian, and here we are going to East Germany. So I was the one who was sent, and it was it was a smart thing to do. Uh, okay, a lot of this is going to be pictures now. I'll try to narrate the, the the inspection for you. We arrived at Leipzig. That was the closest airfield, and that's where the East Germans asked us to arrive, and then we would drive to our uh, site where we needed to go, right? Uh, host company is there, host country is there to greet us, the DDR, uh, and they did. Uh, they had about an eight or nine man team there, uh, clearly intelligence types, maybe not every single one of them, but that was okay. That's to be expected. Uh, nothing wrong with that, right? Colonel Haas uh, was the team chief, and as this inspection went on, I came to love this guy. He was really, really good. He was professional as he could be. I mean, that was he was a German Air Force officer. No flies on this guy anywhere. He was good. Uh, he had a good sense of humor, but he had also a good sense of duty that he didn't let us do every single thing we wanted, but a uh, good guy. There's the Soviet team chief, Colonel Tsigan Kov, a uh, big burly guy. Again, not, not real full of a sense of humor, although it could come out a little bit later. And just a sideline, I met this guy a number of years later, 10 years later. I did a visit to the Soviet Arms Control Agency in Moscow while I was there doing something else. They invited us over, and he was the host. And I gave him one of these pictures, just like this. I still had one. And I presented it to him, and he presented me with the same picture. It was a pretty interesting thing. He knew who I was. I mean, he didn't forget. He knew. And even though I was not... The, I was not the ranking guy on this team. Uh, I was there, there was only four of us. And uh, anyway, Tsigankov was, was okay. He's Russian through and through, no doubt about it. But, but he's a reasonably decent guy, right? Um, there's the Soviet team. Clearly you got, you got translators, that's what this guy here on the left is. Good translator, good with the language. Uh, clearly an intel guy, as were his buddies. Um, Everybody understands GRU? Okay. All right. Base camp was outside of Kotlis. This is southeastern East Germany, not far from the Polish border. All right. Lots of brown coal out there. Not very much, uh, not much agriculture or other industry. Uh, pretty environmentally unsafe or at least uncared for is a, a good way to say it. All right. Not very well tended. They provided us with the transport, right, both helicopters. And we flew in this MIA hip, and it was clearly a VIP helicopter. No doubt about it. Uh, okay. Uh, there it is. You know, nice ride. There's the Liberosa training area. That's the area where this was. It's one of the big training areas in East Germany that the Soviets used. It's not the biggest, uh, because that comes into play here in a little bit. All right? Uh, clearly, not a not a happy place to visit. I mean, it was it was clean and neat, but it was really dirty with coal and military and oil and all kinds of other stuff. All right. One of the first things we saw when out there was an airborne exercise underway. So Stovall said, "Stop the car." And we stopped and we got out. 
Uh, so what do we see? We see these guys landing. They're doing jump drills from helicopters. So there's a, it's an airborne, I, I, it, I think it was more than a company, although a company is about what we saw. Um, and we talked to the guys. They came up, they landed, you know, the Soviets called them over and we talked to them for a while. What, what are, they're soldiers just like our kids. They're, they're young soldiers. They're really good physical condition. They're excited about what they do. Um, and they want to do it well. I, I don't frankly see a problem with that. Uh, so we enjoyed doing that. And we saw the other, some of the other facilities of Libre Ocean. There's a sand table exercise. There's the big training area. And then on the tank range, on the second day, uh, they took us out to, they told us there was a tank range firing that day. So Stovall says, let's go see. And it wasn't on the prohibitor. They can carve out an area here or there that they say are sensitive areas that you can't see. They didn't do that in this case. They said, okay, let's go see. So we go out to this tank range and we climb up. It's a, you have to imagine in front of you is this large set of steps. It's about 200 steps. It's a pretty good climb uh, to this big ridge or hill. On top of that is an observation deck that's about as long as this room, roughly. Right. Uh, about this wide, one wall completely glass looking out over the range, the steps coming up from this side and to the top. Concrete floor, all basic stuff. No frills, no nothing. So we get up there and we're watching. Sure enough, there are tanks going down range and they're firing and we're watching them. You know, so we stayed there for about 25, 30 minutes and then Stovall asked, can we go down and talk to some of the crew members and see some of the equipment? And the escort said, sure, let's go. Now this is the Russian escort. The Germans are with us, but the Germans aren't in charge here because this is Russian forces. So down we went. You can see. I, I will tell you this. This is one of those first, we were the first U.S. people to get this close to a T-80 tank. I took that picture, among others, okay? Uh, and and this one, all right? But the react, you see the, the boxes on those, that's reactive armor. All right? You know, understand what that is. But, uh, we were the first people to get that close, and that's why there are a lot of pictures like this. What the intel people wanted was technical pictures that we could get close and see the different things on a tank, on this tank, uh, and we did. Uh, we were able to do that, which I thought was pretty fascinating, uh, and they didn't stop us. You know, we walked up and we didn't ask if we could take pictures. We pulled the camera out and started taking pictures. If they didn't want us to do it, they'd stop us. The previous day. They had asked us not to take pictures of a train that had some track vehicles on it. They said you can take a picture of the wheel vehicles, but not the tracks. So, okay. so we took pictures of the wheel vehicles. And then the next day we walked right up to the tanks and take pictures. I told you we weren't real good at this. Well, neither were the Soviets at this time. I don't mean they, they weren't good soldiers. They just, nobody knew how to do this. So we got, you got to do a lot of things that you might not otherwise have done. All right. Uh, there I am taking a picture of Snowball, taking a picture of the tank. That's how close we got to the tanks. All right. And there are a couple more. <coughs> okay. There we are next to the thing. There I am with, you know, near the tank barn, you know, or the, the ready area before they would go down and actually do their platoon firing. <coughs> picture on the right. That's, that's me on the right right there. Okay. So, and then later, as we're leaving this tank run, so we've been out there about an hour, an hour and a half. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember this, I don't know, remember the exact time. So we get out to the front where our vehicles are, and up drives the Jeep of General Garyachov, this guy on your right, right there, who was the division commander for the troops that were in the training area. This guy is a rough Russian peasant kind of guy, and he's stupid like a fox. He is one bright guy. He was, he had a case of the ass. And he wasn't mad at us, he was mad at Tsigankov. Because we, he had had an American inspection team in his area and nobody had notified the division commander. And he was hot. And he, 
he gave Tsiganko a dressing down. I don't know how much you know about the Russian language, but Stovall and I are both Russian speakers. When the Russians cuss you out, they don't just call you an SOB and let it go with them. They start with your ancestors. And in Russia, like many things, they, they bring in the animals of the forest and, because that's what they're, and, and all kinds of other things. And, and no animal is whole. It's diseased here, it's done there, or something's wrong here. And they put all these things together. By the time it gets down to you, you feel about that big. Now, still and I are trying to, about to crack up, and we're having to hold ourselves back because Tsiganko is clearly getting it. And he's getting it red hot and often. Uh, and at the end, Gary Cho finishes and Tsiganko apologizes. Then Gary Cho turns to us, and he's all charm. And he invites us back in the afternoon. He says, I want you to come back and we can host you properly. And Crom Stovall says, thank you, General. We'll be back. What time would you like for us to be here? He gives us uh, 2.30 or something, whatever it was, something like that. So we went back in the afternoon, right? um, which was pretty nice. Now, I don't have any pictures of what happened in there, but I'll tell you what happened. We get back into this place. We go back up to 200 steps, which I didn't really want to do again, but okay. <laughs> uh, we go back up to 200 steps, uh, and we're up there, and the place has been transformed. So you have to imagine the same room that I described you earlier. It's all concrete, it's dusty, and the windows are dirty. And when it, the place has been transformed, even the windows are clean. All right, uh, the the floor has been swept and mopped. It's still concrete, but it's clean concrete now. The walls are clean. There's no dust bunnies in the corner, or whatever. There's this big, long set of tables out there with food and drink all over. Because the German group is with us, the Russians are with us, and then there's Stovall and me. And in the corner uh, is a, a big table with a huge Russian samovar, which is normal, and a couple of pretty Russian ladies in black and white. I'm sure they were troops' wives or whatever. Um, and they were there to serve tea. So Garachov gets up there, and he, we talk for a minute, and everybody's in there. And then he says, pointedly, uh, when it's time to sit down, he plinks his glass, everybody waits for a second. He says, Colonel Stovall, now, I, I, I imagine this is the end of the table. He says, Colonel Stovall, sit here. Major Gilroy, sit here. And he sat here with his translator, and the Germans sat over there. <laughs> they were not included in this, although there was food and drink for them, and they did have a couple of things. So Colonel Haas and his guys were cool. They didn't say a word. They sat down. We had a nice talk with General Gagliachov. We talked about families. We talked about military exercises, we talked about our careers, we talked about other things that we were interested in. Uh, they asked me about playing racquetball. What is that? They didn't know what that was. Um, but okay, I, I, just to show you that that's what the conversation was like. Uh, and at the end of it, Gaudet Chov said, thank you very much for coming. I enjoyed having you here. You can see whatever you want. The escorts will take you whatever you need to see. Thank you, gentlemen. And we left. Germans all left too. And in the meantime, nobody had said a word to them. Not one word. Didn't even acknowledge that they were there. Okay, so the inspection goes on. And we see then the second day, we see this train. Again, I told you about they let us take pictures of the wheel vehicles, but not the track vehicles. It's the same train we saw the night before. Because <coughs> we recognized the vehicles and kind of the order and march and what they were. Uh, so we saw that. And I, we're getting ready to go walk to the train, and then what do we see? We see an artillery command control vehicle in a bunker, or not in a bunker, but certainly in a high position or in a sheltered position. And we're thinking, hold on, there's something else going on here. And that's one of the things you can inspect. Well, they didn't tell us about that. They just said, you can go see the train. So actually, I, I saw this first, and I told Stovall, because he was still, I, we had separated by a hundred meters so and he was talking to somebody else and what we turned out to see was a battalion level combined arms attack exercise of course the Russians weren't going to tell us hey you want to come see this exercise and they weren't going to say that but we in essence walked up on it and I remember seeing a couple of the tanks I didn't I don't have a picture from that far away but I'm saying to the translator the guy whose picture you saw earlier uh, he's saying well this this is an area of uh, exercise area, but there's nothing going on here. And I'm looking about 300 meters in the distance and I see some movement in the tree line out there. And sure enough, four or five tanks drive out. I said, those are tanks. And I started walking. I didn't ask. I started, and of course they had to follow me. They're not gonna let me walk around there by myself. 
So we walked up on this combined arms attack. Now you can see, there's all the vehicles there, and I'm this far away from them, and the soldiers are looking at us, and, what in the hell is going on here? There's a guy with a camera, an American flag on his shoulder and whatever, and he's taking pictures of us. You know, we, were the, we weren't expected to be there. We were the bad guys. Um, but it was okay, and we, and we did. And we watched this attack unfold, or this exercise unfold. You can see, this is what we're looking at. Uh, and we didn't just see the, the tanks. We saw, uh, there's some more pictures of the tanks. We saw artillery pieces. We saw armored fighting vehicles. We saw a command and control pie, uh, pieces. There's some BMPs, which are mobile infantry, all right, uh, armored infantry. Uh, there's the artillery weapons, all right, the 2S1s, which is the regimental artillery. So what are we looking at? We're looking at uh, a tank regiment with a, with a motorized rifle element along with it. So, what we're looking at is a regimental level exercise. Combined arms, modern equipment. This is Soviet, Group Soviet Forces Germany. They had all the latest Soviet stuff, whatever it was. Right. And we're looking at a movement to contact group. These guys are moving, they got tanks out front, they got some infantry, they got an artillery command control vehicle in case they need to call fires right away. And they're moving, they're, they're coming for business. Now, that's an exercise, but this is what it looks like. In the meantime, you see that, that train. Now, we, we watched this exercise, and we watched it unfold, and it rumbled all past us. And we turned around, we turned around, the train's still there. It wasn't that far away. Uh, trains were interesting to a guy like Stovall, because as the former chief of the military liaison mission, they would follow trains. That was one of the things they would do because it would tell them what kind of units are moving where inside of East Germany, you see. So following trains to Stovall was like breathing. He knew what to do. I hadn't done this before, although I understood what the point of it was. Um, so we went back to the train again, all right? And we're gonna figure out how to test this agreement. So Siegmund Kost, I told you, he refused to let us take pictures of track vehicles, wheel vehicles only. Uh, after we turned, we went back to Cottbus later. I, uh, the train, we, we came by the train again. The Soviets had, had departed. We were there with the East German escorts, uh, and we were headed back to Cottbus. But on the way back, we came upon the train again. Right? Uh, the same train that was at an overpass. And the Germans said, take all the pictures you want. They didn't care. <laughs> pictures of Soviet equipment, we don't care. Take whatever you want. So we did, uh, and we got a lot of pictures, technical things that we would not have gotten otherwise and learned a lot more about what it was we were looking at. We could pinpoint it a lot more closely than we might have otherwise. Uh, so that made a difference. It also shows you some of the problems with the Germans and Soviets. All right. They are not friendly, not friendly. <clears throat> they didn't get mad at everybody. They didn't get mad at each other, but they were clearly not there to assist one another either, all right? Uh, so there's just some of the pictures that we took on that train, you can see it. Engineer equipment, uh, communications equipment. Uh, a lot of times you can, you can identify what a piece of equipment is by the shape of the, of the vehicle, all right? Well, there's this one, which has a square, uh, a square bed to the thing, or this one which has a, a chamfer cover to it. They, they hold different kinds of equipment. So you can tell what kinds of equipment they are. If you know what kind of equipment it is, you know where it fits into the Soviet order of battle, and you can tell that's a regimental vehicle, that's a division vehicle, that's an uh, army vehicle, that's a theater level vehicle, you know, which would be of high interest if you could see something like that. So we took pictures of it all, because we wanted the intel guys uh, back in Washington and Germany to look at it and say, that's what this is, so they could have a picture of what it was. Uh, and then you see different shapes of them. Groupings of vehicles are just as important as the vehicles themselves. Because they put them in a certain configuration at a certain place, that tells you something of what it is. Particularly the kinds of, we do the same thing. If you see two or three uh, US 557 command control vehicles together, that says something to you that it wouldn't say otherwise. Where if you see a single one, it only says one or two things. All right. So. Then we come to the final day. We'd gotten there late on the first day, so we saw a little bit late on the first day, 
we saw we had a whole second day and we had most of the third day to inspect and then our 48 hours ran out and you had to stop right? uh, for what it's worth you can get technically detailed on the vehicles with these guys okay they know that. I understand well okay I'm just trying to show you that's the kind of stuff we were looking for that's what we were after one picture of the BV was interesting yeah because yeah. yeah. the exercise vehicles they're bees no engineer vehicles are interesting because there are only certain types of engineer vehicles at different levels. So if you see this, you know this is well above regimental level or whatever, right? Uh, same with communications vehicles. If you see communications vehicles that have these, you know, these tropospheric uh, antennas, that's probably a theater level asset because they want to want to communicate long distances, right? So okay. We run the Vice Foster Training Area too, which is right next door to Liberosa Training Area. It's a DDR uh, area, and we saw it too. It was in the specified area, so we saw some German units too. At this point, the Soviets backed out. They let the the Germans. They were there uh, just in case something came up, but they, in essence, let the Germans have us for a little while, and we got a friendlier reception. Uh, not just from Haza. Haza was always okay. But the, the other guys here, um, the guy right in the middle, I don't remember his name, this guy right here is the division commander for the East German units that we were looking at. Right? Uh, they he took us to his division headquarters, all right? Uh, we got great hospitality, gave us a nice, you know, a, a nice kind of light German meal slash snack with, with something to drink in and, and a, and a good vehicle. I mean, they, they were not trying to I don't think they were trying necessarily to impress us, except to say, we know how to take care of our guests. Um, and they gave us the best they had. Right? And then w these other pictures are East German vehicles. There's a motorized rifle battalion. Right? There's the admin site. Remember, they're, they're responsible for hospitality, so near the area where we were is the admin site. Hotel room and caucus. And what, what are we actually looking at in this inspection? What are we actually seeing? Right? We saw regimental rotation through a training site. One regiment coming in, one regiment leaving. But for at least a little while, both regiments were in the training area. So why did we get alerted to go? Because there was the possibility of having more than 300 tanks in an area. And that's one of the limits on the inspection criteria. So the U.S. said, and it was, a, it was not a planned inspection, it was a surprise inspection. They called Stovall and said, go inspect this now. All right. So that's why it was a last minute call. Um, I actually got a little bit of trouble with my boss back in Swayze Moon because there was an event that I was supposed to be at that I wound up missing because I was on this thing. Now they had approved this already, but it just the conflict and schedules made it a little bit more sensitive. Uh, at any rate, so what, what we saw was a regimental rotation. I, we're pretty certain that's what it was. It was not intended to be any kind of violation of anything. Right? Uh, but you don't know that until you go see. Uh, and that's what I, I said. The initial information was it was two regiments, um, which would have exceeded the limit. In fact, we saw one coming and one going. That's why all the trains were there, to put them on trains to take them back to home base. Right? Now, we couldn't get airborne quickly enough, and there's another airborne piece to this, um, to confirm all, we couldn't see it from the top. We, it, it, it all happened a little bit too fast. The other two guys, Stovall and, uh, not Stovall, Wagner and Brunner, were inspecting a different part of the area, and they saw a scud exercise. They actually saw the missile, and so Wagner said to the pilot, land there, now, you know? Of course, he took his time, landed there, you know? because he didn't, want to, he didn't want our guys to get out and be able to see the missile. And while he's taking his time landing, he's saying to the Soviets, get this missile out of here now. You know, so th by the time they got there, the missile was gone. But they, we got some photographs of this scud exercise, which was, now you're looking at a nuclear weapon. So you want to be, you want to be really careful. Uh, and of course, it confirmed what we already knew anyway, that there are some of those units there in this area because it was on the training area. We got pictures of it to show it. Uh, so, and that's what I was saying. Team two saw a scud exercise. Uh, and, you know, tried to get down close to it. They got as close as they could. Uh, 
I, I don't blame the Soviets for doing what they did. I, we probably would have done the same thing. Okay, now, in the end, what about this treaty? Some people look at arms control and stuff and say, ah, so what? Nobody really cares, and the Russians are going to cheat anyway. We haven't found that. I, we have not, I have to say that. Uh, overall, and, and even when I was there later as the CFE person, sorry, excuse me, Even when I was there as the, as the CFE guy, we didn't see the Russians out and out try to cheat. Now, they try to use everything to their advantage? Absolutely. All right. Did they go out of their way to point out things that we weren't looking for? No. <laughs> they weren't going to volunteer anything. We saw some things that were a surprise to us and to them. There were a couple of times we saw things they didn't expect that we were going to see. And the same thing happened at our places. But overall, it's a good deal. First of all, it's a diplomatic measure. It's not purely military. Military didn't dream this up. The diplomats negotiated this. When I say I've worked with arms control, I didn't work on the negotiations end, saying we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But once the treaty was signed and finished, we had to implement it. And how you implement it is how you get that information to give the national command authorities to say, here's what, uh, here's what we're going to do. And we gave ours to the arms control and intelligence staff, uh, which actually worked at the CIA and it had elements from CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, FBI, for counterintelligence purposes, um, the State Department, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. All, so we gave that to, to ACES. ACES then, if they saw a real problem, would bring it up to the National Command Authorities and eventually possibly to the Secretary of Defense to the President. Um, I don't think anything we saw was serious enough to make that trip, but that's the flight path that it would take if it, if it happened that way. All right. One of the problems with this whole thing, and not only in this treaty but other treaties, the U.S. was worried about intelligence that we would give away. They were worried about what how much we had to give, not what we could get. And they were concerned about that. In fact, some of the interagency battles, or the battles that were hardest to fight from our standpoint, were with the U.S. Uh, agencies, not with the Russians or the Warsaw Pact people. Because the U.S. was worried that we might give too much, too much information away, and they didn't want that to happen. So, okay. Um, I think the treaty did help reduce tensions. If nothing else, uh, it demonstrated the blocks could come to some sort of agreement. And I think the other thing that helped reduce tensions, although it's not in here planned, is the contacts we made, military to military contacts, were widespread throughout Europe. All the countries, it wasn't just the U.S. doing this, the French were doing this, the British were doing this, the Germans, the Spanish, the Italians, as well as the Hungarians and the Romanians and the Bulgarians and the Czechs and everybody's involved in this thing. And if you go like we did and spend three days with these guys, you get to know them a little bit because you're spending time with them the whole time. And the same thing is true when they come to visit our units, wherever they were. Uh, in this case, the United States wasn't. The United States, uh, 48 states were not part of this, but the United States forces anywhere in the European theater were part of this. They could even go to Iceland and inspect if they wanted to. That was okay with us because then the Iceland, the Icelandic forces also had the right to inspect other people too. So um, we could do this, and there were a lot of contacts made that I think turned out to be pretty good. Okay, all right. Here's some of the lessons learned. All right, implementation can work. It doesn't always, and we found out some of this. Not necessarily in the CFE treaty, but if you remember the, the Dayton Accords in 1995 to end the war in the Balkans, um, I did conduct one of the first three or four inspections there, and those were harder. Uh, those guys didn't want to be inspected, either side. Um, so it, it isn't always that easy, all right? but it can work. All right? The agreement was actually reasonably well written. Uh, in the end, there's no disagreement on procedures. I told you, we did some things without asking. We just did them. 
And when the Russians came, they would do the same thing. After they saw our first inspection, which was done around Minsk, and our guys went, they had a, had a bag about this, a camera bag, about, the, you know, like you see the journalists, you know, run, run around this thing on your shoulder, what's the pain of the butt to take with you everywhere you go. Um, but we all had a bag like, well, when the Soviets came to us, they all had bags just like that, too. You know, they all, they didn't want to overstep, but they wanted to take advantage of everything that they could. So these things sort of worked themselves out. And every now and then we'd have a disagreement of, can I, can I go see this? Can I take pictures of that? Thing? No, that's a sensitive area. Yeah, but you didn't notify us that was a sensitive area. Yeah, but it is. We forgot. Sorry. So you, you work that out. All right. Uh, okay. We found out that from our side, the planning was effective. We did a good job. But it also emphasized to us the need for detailed training. You couldn't just call some guy and say, hey, come on, we're going to do an inspection. I mean, you could do that, but you weren't going to get a good inspection if you did that. But if you trained the guys ahead of time, and they knew what they were going to do, they knew what they were looking for, and the inspection was well planned, and you know, I'm going to, this day I'm going to do this, and this hour I'm going to do that, then you could, it would work. You could do it. All right? uh, and we learned how to inspect. That's what I'm, I'm telling you now. This paid off later uh, under the CFE agreements. And then the NATO coordination of this thing was poor. Um, I'm not sure if I've got something on a slide here later or not. What we found, it's one of the war stories. What we found out was when we went to the Liberosa training area, this is in the middle of April, the, the Soviets were conducting an exercise in the Letzlinger Haida area. I don't know if you know where Letzlinger Haida is. That's the huge Russian training area just inside of East Germany near Magdeburg. All right? Where if the, if the Russians were gathered at Leslinger Haider, the West Germans started to think, oh my God, somebody's going to invade. And that's how close it was. So they're doing this enormous exercise in Leslinger Haider, and because it's more than 17,000 troops, they had to invite observers. So what happens? Everybody comes. Everybody sent two observers, and most of them sent general officers. Maybe not every, I don't, I don't know if the Danes sent a general officer or sent a colonel or Iceland or something, but the United States sent general officers. Germany, England, Italy, they all sent general officers. So what, now what do you got? Now the Soviets have a problem. They got an escort problem. They got to escort all these guys. They got to provide transportation for them. They got to provide translators. This is a big deal. I mean, that's a lot of folks. They got to house them. Right? Uh, and they all got to be more or less in the same area. You're not going to put everybody in the same hotel, but okay. So this is a big problem for the Soviets. Well, what we also found out later was that the Brits had announced an inspection in what is today Belarus, not far from Minsk. And they were doing another inspection just like ours. So the Sows thought we were stretching them three ways. It was completely uncoordinated. Nobody knew what the other guy was doing. NATO is much better at the coordination now. But back then it was an accident. But you would never convince the Russians of that. They thought we were stretching them in different directions. Which is one of the reasons that when we saw Tsinanko the first time, he was so hot because he had had hit a lot of his people taken to do other things, and he's left, you know, with his leftovers here to help escort us. So all that mattered. Right. All right, soldiers, soldiers. We learned how to get along with these guys, even though they weren't happy to see us. They're soldiers. Everybody's working for his country. Every nation's proud of how professional the soldiers are. Um, we talked about all kinds of things that are common to all of us. Um, and it was a lot of fun, frankly. I mean, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, one of the things that people think sometimes the Soviets don't take care of the soldiers, we didn't see that at all. We saw every place we went, we saw uh, a mess truck or a mess outfit of some sort to take care of the, the food. We saw medical care. We saw break areas. We saw reasonable safety procedures to make sure that Nobody got hurt because they were stupid and you, did, you didn't take care of We didn't. I didn't see that from the Soviets. Now, maybe that's true in some other places, but at this place, at this time, and again, this is Group Soviet Forces Germany. These are the, these are the best of the Soviet forces. They were good. I, my hat's off to them. They were good. All right. Uh, the tension between the Soviets and East Germans was so obvious. It was incredible. Uh, and I told, I'll tell you another story about it in a minute. Okay. I, and then... Uh, leave questions to you. Colonel Haza was a who. All right. He, of course, you, you, I told you the story of the training tower, the training area. 
the last night before you leave, you always have a farewell dinner. And we were at a hotel in Columbus. So we're in a, in a room, again, roughly the size of this one, maybe a little bit smaller, but shaped differently. And the tables were there in a U configuration. Uh, everybody was there, including our other two guys, who had not been there for the tank training exercise. Uh, they were doing something different. And everybody's gathered around. The Soviets are there. The East Germans are there. We're there. Turned out there was some American gymnasts there that were having a tournament or something in Columbus. So we actually saw some American young girls, American girls and boys there. Totally unexpected. Uh, but anyway, we go into the room for dinner. Everybody talks for a minute. Haza clinks his glass and says loudly so that everybody can hear. Colonel Stovall, sit here. Major Guillory sit here, and the Soviets sat over there. <laughs> it was one of the neatest diplomatic turnarounds I have ever seen, and it was exactly right. It was perfectly done, and Haza knew it. Now, he didn't crack a smile, neither did Siganko, but both of them knew exactly what was happening. And we had a nice dinner. Nobody talked to the Soviets at all. We had a nice dinner with the Germans for that evening. We all said goodnight, and we left the next morning. Uh, it was pretty interesting. And, I, and I've got a couple more pictures here, but I'll stop and let you ask questions. I've got a whole slew of pictures I can show you. Questions, comments, obscene remarks, whatever. Go ahead. It might be unfair to ask, but clearly this was a big success. Can that be replicated, say, with China going forward, or was this pretty unique to the time? Of the, I, I, it, the answer is probably yes. All right. Uh, I think it can be replicated. But much depends on the times and what goes on. At this point, uh, the Soviet Union was breaking up. I'm sorry, it was not breaking up. But they were at least willing to talk and willing to uh, willing to say, it's okay if you come see us. There's not much you can do about this anyway. <clears throat> so this is 1988. This is a year and a half before the wall comes down. Uh, and we didn't know what we were going to find. We didn't know how angry or nasty or whatever the Soviets were going to be or the East Germans or anybody else. And they didn't know what we were going to do either. So we were at least willing to take the risk. And as it turned out, uh, soldier to soldier, we did okay. All right. Whether this is a good idea out in the future or not, well, you're asking the wrong guy. I, I, I would, it's been demonstrated that it, once that it can be done. Uh, could it be done with the Chinese? Their mindset is different from the Soviets, so it's kind of hard to tell. But again, what are you looking at? In our case, the Soviets and the American forces in the East, East German and West German, and all those other forces were in really close proximity to each other. That's not true with China, at least not in any grand sense. I mean, there are a couple of spots here or there. Um, so you know, how do you do that with the Chinese? What are you doing? Um, you know, let will inspect the forces in Hawaii. But even the forces in Hawaii, doesn't matter to the Chinese because if there's going to be a fight somewhere, we're going to marshal forces and take them to the fight wherever it is. Uh, they're going to do the same thing. So how do you? What's to inspect and what what do you gain from it? You see, there were other things to gain from this agreement, not just the military things. And that's what I said in the beginning: the civil, the human rights, and the economic things were important to the Soviets and to the East Europeans. It may not be that important to the Chinese. So getting a similar agreement. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. I understand our Navy has tried repeatedly to right. link up with their opposite numbers, just the way you described with this. And it, it either happens or it doesn't. It's, it's like a revolving door, or whether it's in favor now, or not. Oddly enough, we have experience with naval agreements, too, although it's a little older. About 100 years ago, maybe a little less than that, we tried naval agreements between the First and Second World War, um, and countries paid attention to them kind of sort of somewhat. Uh, but not all the time. Naval agreements are much more difficult to verify um, and, and actually try to tell whether someone's paying attention to it or not. Much more difficult. How do you verify a submarine? You, know, you let somebody go on it? I don't think so. So, uh, okay, other questions, comments? Anything These guys else? are going to geek out on the photos. 
Oh, you want to see the photos? Okay. Mm -hmm. These guys are going to want to see All the right, photos. Hang on. I've seen the photos. All tab, <laughs> right? All tab. Go back in the presentation. All right. Okay. So, here, okay. That's a 55. Turn your ears. You got to stand on this side. You're going to the screen. They're going backwards. Okay. These are these are some of the pictures. If you don't mind, Brian, I'm going to sit down. No, I don't care. These are some of the pictures that we took that show different kinds of vehicles, engineer vehicles, um, other kind of recovery vehicles, other kinds of things that are that are there. I'm just going to go through the pictures, and if I see something unusual, I'll say so, or you can ask. There's the tanks again. I'm just. Now, now was, that, was that the one when you guys saw? The <coughs> no, we saw the whole platoon of tanks. We and then we saw. I said we saw a whole company of tanks, and then we saw that exercise. Remember, I showed uh, the you exercise, but they, the ones out in the exercise weren't equipped with the ERA, though. No, not in all cases. So I said that must look like it was. You know, but that's what out, that's what our intel guys wanted to see. They want to see the sights. They want to see the gun. They want mm -hmm. to see the the reactive armor. I mean, they want to see all that. Yeah. So, all right. Um, okay, that's part of the airborne exercise. There's the BMP. I showed you these already. Yeah, the artillery, stop when you need that's an ACRV, artillery command and control vehicle. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, there's the paratroopers again. There's the, the big picture of the train that we saw, which led to the battalion exercise that we looked at. Um, they tried to provide overhead cover. They couldn't in all cases. But they made an effort at it. Again, I'm seeing that's that's the train. Remember, I showed you. I told you it was a train on an overpass. That's it. I mean, that's the same one. There's the ACRV. There's the howitzers getting into position. All right. Uh, so you saw a firing battery occupying a position, which is something we practice all the time. How you get in position, get ready to fire. And uh, our bosses bother us. I know theirs too. The IPRF. You're in position, ready to fire. They want you there in a hurry. They want you to be ready. Yeah, I say ACRB again. Just curious if that was a dish, radar dish. That's a hatch. That's a hatch. Yeah. That's a hatch. Where was it back there? That's a, that's a small turret on the center. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yep, BMPs. In this case, it's interesting. That's a, that's a BMP-1. That's the original BMP with the 73 millimeter cannon. The BMP-2s have a, a chain gun on them, similar to our Bradley's, which is it's different. It's like the twos on the train. It could be. That could be, yeah. And the um, three was a tank in disguise. Yeah, there's the tanks. This is just some pictures that we saw from the air. We we flew over the train here. The first thing we did was we did a, a round robin flight of the train of the specified area. Show me the area. Put me in an helicopter. Let me go see. There's some of the vehicles again. A lot of I don't know if this one is. I'm not any kind of an analysis expert. The shapes of these vehicles matter. Um, and even if if you don't see something. That tells you something too, all right. So uh, there's a again an engineer vehicle. It's got the blade up in the front. That's not a guy who digs fighting positions, but he can dig a little parapet to get behind or whatever. Uh, extra fuel can on the rear. Right. Important. There's a BMP too. All right. With a 20 millimeter gun. On. You can see how the train here. It's all torn up. I mean, it's, not a pretty sight. Again, I, you'll see a lot of these. The, the guys asked us to take to get as close as we could to the sites and the other things to show us the technical things of the tank so they can analyze it and study it. And we did. You can see the towing cables. All of them. It's, it was well done. This is all out of that tank range where we were. That's just a hotel. They, they put us in the, there were no big deal. There was a single run with a single bed in it. It was clean and neat. No, no frills, nothing else in it. No mini bars. We learned when they came for CFE things that we would put them in decent hotels. And in Germany, a lot of the hotels, Germany, France, hotels had mini bars. They would drink them dry. Yeah. Uh, so we learned quickly under the CFE, one of the first things we do when we got hotels, we talk, empty the mini bar. You want to put water or something? Okay. Otherwise, empty it. Because they would drink it dry and we'd have to pay for it. So we would tell the, the hotel people, stop it. <laughs> and they would. They, they were pretty much. The, Ru the Russians figured it out really quick. How was uh, the Wi Fi? 
Huh? That was the Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> There's the, tri the, the admin area. Picture of me reading the Stars and Stripes. I took a couple of Stars and Stripes with me and left them there, just in case anybody wanted to see them. Oh, that's right before the inspection started, before we split up. These are a lot of the stuff. Sorry about this. If, if I pass one up too fast and you want to see it, say something. That's East German units, but they're BMP ones. There's a configuration. I, I think that's a regimental headquarters, but I'm not 100% sure. You can see the troops off to the right. It might be the might be the, the mess area and whatever. So it's a. Uh, yeah, there's oh clearly there's stuff hidden in the trees. Okay, I'll go to the next one. Yeah. Finish. Okay. This is at the end. Oh, that's at the beginning. I'm sorry. I want to get to the end to show you. There's the East German uh, guys who who took care of us. They were nice people. They took good care of us. Cooks. We went over and talked with the cooks. And they they enjoyed that. They like talking to us and, and BS with us. There's the guy clothes. Early on, uh, the East German guy who was translating for Hase was really having trouble. He was clearly, he was taught British English, uh, and he was having trouble communicating with Stovall and Hase. And I noticed that about two hours in, I went to Stovall and said, let me do this. I said, I'm much better at it than this guy is. Uh, and we talked for a minute, Stovall said okay, and Hase said okay. Uh, so I did it. I did the translation between Stovall and Hase, and it worked much better. And at the end of the inspection, the East German Lieutenant Colonel, I'll show you a picture of him, man, who was doing it, came to me and said, thank you. He said, I was, I was overwhelmed. I said, I know you were, and I'm sorry for that. Um, I, it wasn't our intention to do that. He said, not a problem. He said, I'm glad you took over. I have a picture of that guy. So that's Ralph Bruner. That's one of the other inspectors. Uh, this guy in front of the yellow vehicle here, big husky East German E7. He was the driver of our vehicle. He's the man. He can flat drive that vehicle. He can take it a lot of places. It's not designed to go. <laughs> and bring it back. I mean, he was good. I have, my hat's off to him. He was really good. Uh, I think that's the training area. There's a... It looks like a nuclear power plant. It's not. It's a brown coal power plant. It was just, just one of those polluters par excellence. I mean, if you the, the book definition would show that picture. You know, it's, uh, that's in the in the helicopter. That's Haza. I mean, that's Sigakov. It's kind of the admin area for Libero's training area. There's a troops doing PT, out running, just like we would do. There you can see a, a, a bridge, bridge, you know, bridge unit there. Um, yeah. Again, some of these, are, there's General Garyachov. I got a kick out of him, he was all right. I think I've shown you these pictures already, so I'm gonna, if you don't mind, I'm, if you want me to stop, tell me. Can you guys do a dinner with Garyachov too? No, but that, that was the afternoon in the, in the tower with Garyachov. Okay, I just remember the toast. The oh, that's a different thing. I'll, I'll okay. tell you about a toast, man. Oddly enough, at this particular inspection, we didn't see that toast. Okay. Uh, we were not at, at a dinner like that. But I'll tell you about it. We saw the CFE inspections all the time. Sorry, I don't mean to double up, but I think you've seen all these already. Um, there's the, the four of us. The two guys on your left and the other two, Warren Wagner and Ralph Brenner. <coughs> that's all part of the, the area. That's the Air Force pilot flew us there. That's that engineer vehicle I told you about. Okay. I don't know how many more I got to go. About 40 more. It's fine. We're going to run out of battery. <laughs> All right. Just a minute. That's at the East German headquarters. Uh, the guy on the far left here is the guy who was the translator who, who, could, who was having trouble keeping up. He was trying. I, Again, he was given a, a good effort, but he couldn't do it. Uh, Stovall would speak and would use American military language, and Haase would speak and use German military language, and he didn't have any idea how to, how to do some of this. I'd been doing it for years, and uh, so it was easier. Airborne again, there's the kids again. 
think you got so somebody's in here twice. Yeah, we're saw, saw, seeing some of these things twice. Okay. Uh, one thing I'll tell you, Brant mentioned the toast. I didn't see this at this inspection. I did later when we inspected in the former Soviet Union or places where there were Russian forces. When you get to a place, you go to a dinner, and usually the first night, uh, the local commander, not the escort, not the sea escort, but the local commander, in this case, Garyachov, would host the dinner. And there are always toasts at the dinner. The Russians have vodka out there, and I'm not going to go into the drinking part. We don't drink with them all night, and they know that. But we have a toast at the beginning, and the commander gets up, and he's proud of his unit, so he'll, he'll toast the unit, and he'll say some of the good things about it, particularly if it's got a distinguished history or something. He'll mention a couple of things. And it's all legitimate. Uh, it, some of us over the top bragging, but that's okay. He's the boss. Let him do it. And, and we drink to it. And then the U.S. senior guy makes the next toast. When I was there, it was me. If I was the commander, I, so I would do it. I would try to keep it short. We talk about soldiers doing their duty, and if we do our duty, both our countries are better for it, blah, blah. And I try to keep it short and say, we look forward to a you know, fruitful relationship here, blah, blah, and we drink. Well, the third toast at a Russian military dinner, I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, the commander lifts his glass, and everybody else does. And you don't clean glasses over there. You lift it, you make eye contact. You make eye contact with everybody. You go to drink it, he holds the glass back, makes eye contact again, and he puts it down. The third toast is a silent toast to fallen comrades. I'm not a fan of the Russians, but I give them that one. That's classic. That's well done. It really is. Right. And for them, it's real. All of them lost somebody in a war somewhere. So for them, it's real. Not just family members, but comrades too. Um, so that's a. Uh, in this case, a lot of these guys had lost somebody in Afghanistan, but even going back certainly to World War II. Uh, that's a major thing. The Russians will do that well. I had occasion to do it. One of the inspections we did up in, in the, well, at the time, it wasn't Leningrad, it was St. Petersburg again. Uh, we sat in the dining room in a big building in downtown St. Petersburg that was the former dining room of the regiment that the Tsar belonged to. We had dinner there. We did the same thing. We had this island toast just like everything else. That was kind of a neat experience. You don't ask for things like that. They just, that's the dining room they brought us to have dinner. And uh, so it was good. And when they give you dinner, or whatever, I have to say this again for the Russians, they give you the best they have. May not be very good, may not be what you and I would do, but they give you the best they have. They want you to be happy and satisfied. That's part of their hospitality. Soviet or no Soviet, they haven't lost that. That's part of being Russian. And so it's a nice part of it. Okay, I can continue to tell stories, but you're over I'm, time. I'm over time. Huh? <laughs> <laughs>